radio station. Our next guest, Dr. Michael Osterholm, director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, former state epidemiologist at the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, wrote a book in 2017 called Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. And on what I'm sure is another in an endless series of busy days for him, he's kind enough to join us on the Whiting Clinic LASIK and Cataract Hotline. Doctor, good to chat with you. It's been a while. Thank, Thank you for you. the uh, time. Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, this, based on other interviews I've heard with you, is this time around feels more personal for you, maybe less abstract as someone who makes it his life's work to deal with these sorts of issues and these sorts of threats. Why is it more personal for you and less abstract? Well, I think it's personal for all of us. Um, you know, when we have these outbreaks that occur somewhere else in the world that, uh, you know, are serious uh, and and concerning, like Ebola and so forth, you know, we have a way of kind of it's over there, don't worry, it's not here. Um, even when you have outbreaks here, for example, measles, which can be a very serious situation. It was primarily in one segment of the Minneapolis population, and most people said it doesn't really involve me. This one is going to touch every family in Minnesota. Uh, this is one that uh, I can't emphasize enough what the potential is to actually cause us real harm. Um, you know, in the CDC work that's been done recently bringing together a group of international experts in the area of, of modeling what we call this, trying to anticipating this, you know, the estimates were that there'll be between 160 and 214 million people that will be infected over the course of this outbreak in the United States just through uh, late summer. Um, when you look at that, that's as many as 200,000 at the very, very low end, up to 1.7 million people could die from this, which surely puts it in a very different category than, than influenza, as we talked about it. The thing that's also really concerning is, is that um, we could have up to 21 million people who are going to require hospitalization, which would literally crush our medical care system, which only has about 925,000 staffed hospital beds. And a fewer of a ten, uh, fewer than a tenth of those, about ninety thousand, are actually uh, beds for people who are critically ill, which we'll need. So, I mean, we see this coming at us, and um, you know, I don't think that the public can t uh, take this too seriously. It's not uh, an issue to be, you know, panicked about. It's not an issue that we should become irrational. But we have to understand this is serious and significant. And when you're here, and you're going to hear more in the near future, very near future, about needs to, re, you know, to minimize contact in large crowds and so forth, and particularly among older individuals who may be at much higher risk of a serious disease outcome if they get infected. Take this seriously. This is really an important issue. What what lessons can we draw? Can you update us on what current conditions are? in china um the some of the reports indicate that it is uh, heading in a much better direction is it no uh, at what no. cost etc cetera, etc cetera. what do we know what do we think we know yeah yeah no great question dan great, very good question um this is one of those issues of where first of all you have to understand it's china and what i mean by that is, is that when this outbreak took off in china obviously it exploded and the Chinese were able to do what most other countries in the world could not even think of doing, and that was bring in almost draconian population movement restrictions. Many people haven't been out of their house in 10 to 12 weeks and couldn't. Um, and so that in that regard, they did basically suppress this infection. It, it's, you know, it dropped dramatically. But the challenge is their economy also then went to pieces. And so now they're trying to restart their economy, which means many millions of people will be going back into subways, buses, trains. They'll be crowded cheek to jowl in manufacturing plants. They'll be back in public spaces. And as infectious as this virus is, uh, we just don't see any way that these numbers will stay suppressed. You know, once they release that kind of almost, uh, uh, what I would say, you know, imprisoned kind of uh, perspective, so even China isn't there, but there is one lesson in China that should be a lesson to us, and this is one of the things I've been trying to help people at the policy level understand. This emerged in China in mid-November. We have pretty close data, data here to show that when this virus actually jumped out of animals into humans. And uh, it didn't get picked up until 
clearly into late December when there were enough cases that people realized this just wasn't the flu. But if you think about this from mid-November till now, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, four and a half, five months going into this thing now. And there's still cases happening. Yeah, they're happening right now, even with all this suppressive activity. And so think about here, what we're seeing happen in Minnesota or the United States, we're probably in the first month, a month and a half. And this is going to last through the summer, into the fall. I mean, this is, this is not going to be a Minneapolis blizzard. This is going to be a coronavirus winter, and we're just in the first week or two of the season. Uh, speaking of the summer, uh, uh, some people have wondered whether there was any chance, any reason to believe that this particular virus might be affected uh, by warmer weather in a positive way. I mean, is there any yeah. reason to believe that that would have any? That's going to have any impact? Uh, the answer is no, maybe. And what I mean by maybe, anything can happen. We don't know about. You know, we've never seen this virus like this before. But let me just give you the other coronaviruses because actually I was very involved with both of these investigations. In uh, 2003, we had SARS, which occurred in um, China, that then spread to the outside world. And uh, when we first realized that it was basically in February that this was happening and it took us almost two months to figure out that these patients are not at all that infectious till about the fifth or sixth day of illness. And if we catch them early, we can get them into these isolation areas in the hospitals. And when that happens, we can stop transmission. Well, we finished it, the job, you might say, in early June. But it really had to do with just the time period it took to get it done. It didn't have anything to do with the weather. If you look at MERS, the other coronavirus infection that has continued to be a problem in the Arabian Peninsula since it first emerged in 2012 is a virus that's in camels that keeps hitting humans because unlike in, in the SARS where we figured out it was these palm civets, these animals sold in the markets of the Guangdong province and got rid of them, they, they were out of the market. So people stopped getting pinged with the virus. In the Middle East, they keep getting pinged time and time again because the camels are still infected. Well, I've, I've actually stood there outside of a hospital in, in, in Dubai working on an outbreak of this where it was 110 degrees out, <laughs> mm. and and the virus was transiting mighty fine, thank you. A large outbreak occurred in Seoul, Korea with this um, in 2015 when somebody came back from the Middle East, infected somebody else in Seoul. They sat in an emergency room at Samsung Medical Center and infected 82 people. That ha- happened in May, June. Um, even if you look at influenza, seasonal flu surely does occur in the winter seasons of the northern and southern hemispheres, but people forget that it transmits year-long in the, in the tropic regions. It's there all the time. Doc- so, so I don't think there's any real evidence to support that this is going to end up uh, changing you know, how it's transmitted. Dr. Michael Ulsterholm is our guest. Let's talk. There's been a lot of discussion about testing and testing protocol and where we are in, in terms of the numbers and how much not having tests available has hamstrung us. So from your perspective, give us where exactly, um, based on your understanding, we are in terms of how many tests are being administered, and from your perspective as well, how important an issue this is. Is this part of the reason we're playing catch-up ball here, or or where does this factor in, and, and, and obviously who are the people who need to get tested? Well, first of all, the testing situation has been unfortunate. And, uh, you know, the CDC, for all intents and purposes, has dropped the ball. No other way to say it. Um, I think this is quickly being rectified by, by several ways. One is CDC is doing a better job. But there's a number of private companies now that have come to play uh, that are going to be helping out. And even right here in Minnesota, the Mayo Clinic has developed a test, which is a, a great test that will be very helpful. So I think testing is going to improve. Um, what we need to do is understand where this is at in our community. So it's not that we just want everybody to go out and get tested because, first of all, if, you, if I test you today and you're negative, it means nothing, but you couldn't be positive tomorrow. And so this isn't like a one-time test. I know I do or I do, do or don't have a certain condition. This is not like that. Um, and so we want to test people who are symptomatic with a respiratory-type illness first and get as many of these people tested so that we can understand 
are they in fact infected with this COVID-19 virus and and do that. And so it has set us back in the sense of understanding uh, and we, what we might have several weeks ago about transmission here, but the health department is doing just a tremendous job of following up, and I think they're working closely with the clinical community to get people tested. And you know, I think within the next couple of days, it's not going to be anywhere near the issue it has been. And I, and I'm, you know, I'm. How shall I say this uh, gently? I think the department is going to be able to show that we do have substantial transmission beginning here in Minnesota. The the ongoing question it seems to be an answer to seems to be changing almost daily is the degree to which we attempt to isolate ourselves. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people are already staying at home as much as possible. We know about the, the, the suggestion and maybe now becoming more, to that, more than that, edicts coming down regarding uh, events, large groups, maybe even bars, etc. So we have to still live. You know the practicalities of this. How far, if you're if you're advising to the average listener is just paying attention and going, My God, I mean the picture being painted here, what the what the hell do we do? Yeah. What what yeah, do you say yeah. that that's practical? What what's the what's the prescription? Well, I think again the consequences of this disease are so substantial that uh, you know, we have to make the case and, and I've always said I'd rather be uh uh, you know, having to defend why I did something uh, rather than defending why I didn't. Um, and so I think in this case, we also have to be wise. We, we, don't, we surely have to be careful that we don't hurt people, organizations, etc., needlessly by just doing anything. And so I think what you're going to see here, though, is, is that uh, when the curve starts to go up of cases, meaning the number of cases, new ones per day, that is often when it hit this acceleration point. You know, it's when you kind of double the cases. You go from, you know, it's one thing to go from 100 to 200, but you go from 1,000 to 2,000 and to 4,000 and to, to 8,000. That Those last few doubling times, which each are about five days apart, really can make the difference between night and day. And so our job is to suppress that curve. That's where you keep hearing this term, flatten the curve. And it's going to take some pretty extreme distancing issues to really do that. And so it shouldn't be long-lived in the sense that, you know, we've really got to do it now. And if we can flatten that curve and and keep it that way, then, you know, what we're going to do is not likely necessarily have fewer cases in the state. And we have to be honest with that. The eventual will occur. But the difference is if you have, for example, 100 cases today that present to a hospital, that hospital will be overwhelmed. If you have 100 cases but you present with 10 a week for mm-hmm. the next 10 weeks, we can provide much, much better medical care, and more people are going to survive and live. And so what the whole point of this is, is to try to suppress that number of new cases down by just fewer contacts. And, you know, I I realize this is going to be an inconvenience. It's an economic hardship. You know, we have clearly, from our perspective, said, you know, we have to take care of these businesses. We have to take care of, of people who are suffered from this. And the second thing for us is that I have said all along, I've written about this extensively, is that as goes health care, will go the psyche of our population. If hospitals are overrun, which right now the number of beds required are far in excess of what we have, but how do we provide auxiliary care? How do we, how do we help these people? And how do we protect our health care workers? Because when health care workers get infected from caring from these patients, they go from care providers to somebody needing care. That is a huge loss. And so one of the things we have to do is also protect our health care workers with the appropriate respiratory protection and so forth, and that's going to be in short supply. And so how do we prioritize that? How do we help that? Well, something as creative and yet as simple as instead of taking care of 20 patients in 20 different rooms where every time you're in the room and you walk out, you have to take off all your protective equipment and throw it away, let's try to find wards. We can put 20 people in one ward wall that off and then you don't ever have to take your equipment off and and so we can maximize it so we need to look at things like that we need to be creative if there was ever a time for minnesota creative imagination it's right now a couple of unrelated questions that i've gotten actually from some listeners when i mentioned we we're going to have you on that i think are practical questions that a lot of people have would you fly would you recommend flying even domestically if it was not you know an emergency situation necessary what's your view on flying well I will actually give you my personal experience. I was uh, asked to be on a major MSNBC show tomorrow night with Rachel Maddow in New York, and uh, I would not fly to New York. I'm doing it remotely from here. So, I mean, I've already made my choices. I basically have cut out any kind of 
of public transportation like that. And, you know, it's not even so much the airplane. I mean, the airplane air filtering actually is pretty good. Mm. It's the cattle crowd that you have right there at the yeah. when you get on the gate when you're in the, in the terminal and so forth and so i think that that's the kind of thing that we're talking about avoiding and and that's where the chances just go up this virus actually is spread by just the respiratory route meaning that it's one where just breathing and breathing in someone else's air who is nearby you is enough to transmit this you don't have to touch them you don't even have to be in three to six feet to them you can be even a little further away than that and so that's what we're trying to do is avoid those numbers and at the same time let me be clear nobody has the data to say you know 10 is better than 50 is better than 100 better than 200 it's all intuitive if you look there's no modeling data that says oh this will cut down 95 percent of the case transmission if you go below this number you know we're doing this one by the seat of our pants and and we have to be honest about that should uh, upcoming elective surgeries be rescheduled all of these should be. Uh, we need to clear these hospitals out as much as we can. And, and we have to remember, people are still going to have heart attacks. Yeah. They're still going to have asthma attacks. They're still going to have, you know, uh, cancer issues, etc. And this was one of the challenges that happened in China, was the fact that many people who had these very acute situations could not even be seen in hospitals because they were so overrun. So our healthcare uh, facilities have to plan for those too. And, you know, I can tell you the American Hospital or the Minnesota Hospital Association, together with local hospitals, are doing a lot of planning right now and they're anticipating this and and all, all i can say is you know you know thank god we have our police and firemen and people who really take care of us and all i can say is thank god we have the frontline healthcare workers right now that are willing to walk into the fire and take care of all these people who have this infection we've heard a lot about how children tend to have mild illness compared to the mm-hmm. elderly seeing increasing evidence and i think you've been quoted on this yep. asymptomatic people may play a significant role in transmission so how do children play into this spread uh, children play into it in the sense that they do get infected, but we don't know how infectious they are. There are some situations, for example, if you look at influenza virus, when we have influenza in schools, these kids are like little virus reactors. I mean, they're just loaded. And they swap it out quickly with their fellow classmates, and then they take it home, and then mom and dad and the older brothers and sisters all get it from, from these younger kids. We don't know that's the case with this one. And, in fact, what little data we have says it may not be the case. Um, um, I mean, just anecdotally, for example, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong had virtually similar responses to the virus in terms of, of re, you know, basically mitigation strategies, distancing, all that. The one thing was Singapore didn't close schools, Hong Kong did, and there was no difference in the response. And so one of the things we're looking at is does that really make a difference because closing schools has a huge impact. Well, up to about 20% of healthcare workers will be lost because they have to stay at home with their kids. They don't have other any kind of care. So you can't make these decisions lightly. You have to really think about what the impact is. But at the same time, if they're going to increase the likelihood of transmission in the community, we need to know that. So that's another thing we're trying to understand and learn. Is, is Singapore a relative success story? And if so, are there lessons to learn from their approach? Yeah. Well, you know, let me just say that, uh, again, everything is in flux. Singapore has now just recently had some big increases in case numbers and what one time they thought was pretty much a contained situation. And as we've learned, they may not be at all. And so, uh, you know, this virus is like trying to control the wind. It's about like that. And, you know, you can dampen it down, but you can't get rid of it. And that's why I say even what's happening with China will be a grand experiment of itself when they release these um, uh, people back into the workforce, what's going to happen. In Italy announced 368 new deaths in a single day, total death toll. Now uh, 1,809 total reported cases, just under 25,000. The horror stories out of there, I'm sure you can tell us some, are horrendous. Yeah, they're, they're, they're tough. They're is tough. is they're there tough. is that what we're heading for, or well, are there surely, ways for there us to... There could be some hospitals in this country where people are going to have to make decisions about who lives and dies. I mean, this is part of the challenge. You know, I, I wrote the, my first paper on this back in 2005, saying we're not prepared. we got to get prepared. And I wish it was 2005 again, because we're less prepared today than we were in 2005. You know, we have basically uh, cut our health care system down to the bone. There was no excess capacity there. They had no money to stockpile masks, gloves, gowns, things like that. And so we can't suddenly make up for all these, no matter how fast 
these uh, companies that make this equipment are doing it. There just was not going to be enough. So I think that that's a really huge challenge for us is, you know, how are we going to move forward? How are we going to protect our, our, our workers and so forth? Where are we going to get this kind of equipment? And so these, these are the lessons we should have learned we didn't. And so we're not well prepared today at all for this. Last question. I'm looking at a, a I looked at a, earlier at a story today that got some attention out of the Washington Post from May 2018, and it noted that the top White House official in charge of pandemic response, along with his team, got yeah. broken up. He basically left the job. Team got broken up, and even then, there were, uh, it was it was said that it, that came at a time when when many experts say the country is already underprepared for the increasing risks of a pandemic. Um, it, 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 is that a legitimate? reason why at the federal level is that coming back to haunt us at the federal level or is that uh, too simplistic um I, I would say it's a little of both i mean first of all the federal government's a big big place where there's other expertise that resides but um you know i uh tim zemers who is the person you're right. referring to who's uh, uh, a dear friend and colleague i'll tell you he's desperately missed in terms of coordination with the national security council about how to anticipate these situations how to respond to them and uh, you know we know that i mean this is not a partisan comment this administration has attempted to cut the public health budgets uh, when they were already very lean they've uh, had eliminated any of the expertise in the white house as such in this area um, and so, you know, there was a lot of catching up to do just to get into the situation on behalf of the White House. And, again, that's not a partisan comment. That's just the reality. So, but, um, you know, at the same time, I'll have to say that um, under, and I don't care who the president would be right now. It would be a challenge to deal with this because this virus, like I said, spreads like the wind. And uh, so that's that's a challenge. The, the president had a briefing today, which I didn't watch, but a number of people who did said they thought there was a, a sea change in the seriousness with which, after he got past the self-congratulation part, the seriousness with which he was speaking, almost as if a light bulb had, had finally gone off in his head. Uh, do you can you speak to that? Did you watch him well, today? Yeah, Did you yeah, see I mean, any I difference? I can't speak to what was going on inside his head, but I can obviously tell you the words he said. Is he thought that we now have to understand that the worst of this could extend well into August? Uh, Tony Fauci, a friend and colleague, who just uh, eight days ago said that this was uh, you know low risk for the country. Uh, responded uh, in asking, being asked a question, and said that this is a very, very serious situation with a very, very dangerous bug. So you know, and the very varies were multiple. So I think that they are at a federal level telegraphing right now where people seem to understand this to be, and I think it's the right place. They're at the right place. Uh, they're, they're there now. I promise this will be the last one. I really appreciate <laughs> your, your time because I know you're overloaded. Yeah. Um, is it your if if the governor comes to you for advice, and I'm sure he's talked to you a few times. He has. Is is it your has your advice been if you got a decree or find a whatever legal way to shut down restaurants? In terms of going in to eat and yeah, bars, yeah, let's yeah. do it. Are you in that camp? Well, first of all, the governor has that authority now. Right. A declaration. Second of all, let me just make one comment here because this is important. You know, I've worked for the last five presidential administrations. I worked for two Republican governors, two Democratic governors, and one independent governor while I was at the state health department. And no one can tell you from a work standpoint my partisan politics. I'm just a private in the public health army, and my job is to serve. So let me just take this comment in that context because. Whatever your party affiliation is here in Minnesota, I have to say I think this governor has done a tremendous job of reaching out. I have had an opportunity to advise him and his staff on multiple occasions. I think we have one hell of a health department here under Jan Malcolm. And this governor reached out to the, all the previous governors for their advice and, 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 um, and their input. He's reached out across the aisle in terms of the elected officials. And i got to say I'm proud to be from Minnesota today because there's other states right now where I see the governors uh, not doing that. And I think that they are – they're going to, in a sense, not do the job they could and should. So, I, you know, my hat's off to the governor right now, and I could care what party he's from. I just want a governor who will lead us, a governor who will tell us the truth, and a governor who is prepared to do whatever he has to do to deal with us. And you want stuff shut down? Pardon? Restaurants shut down? 
Do you think that's a good that's a that's a necessary step? I think you're going to see a number of things like this happen just to try to break the back of this what I think is going to be the beginning of the big uptake and curve. What's going to hopefully keep us from being another northern Italy is we don't let it get there. If we let it get there, then then we've lost all control. Doctor, I really appreciate the extended time. Hope we can do it again down okay, the road. Thanks anytime. again. Anytime. I have appreciate a good one. it. Thank you, you sir. Take D- care. Dr. Michael Osterholm, the uh, director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, University of Minnesota, and, of course, former state epidemiologist at the Minnesota Department of Health. We'll break, uh, kind of collect our thoughts and review a couple of the more interesting things that he told us. Don't forget, we're going to carry at least a portion of of the governor's press conference scheduled for 5 o'clock with perhaps some new announcements and some uh, new restrictions or new ideas. Which apparently has been pushed back to 5.30. Oh, okay. Well, then... uh, I'm going to have to... Begessling is a victim today of the governor's press conference. We've moved him three or four times. We're we're socially distancing ourselves from Gessling, so we're going to have to try to bring him back here in a minute. Well, might not... I mean, he just might have to live with it. This is Bumper to Bumper with... On the...